Joshua. Uh, for those of you who have been with us, we're doing a series called Choose This Day. We're in Joshua. Today we come to chapter eight, but we can't get to chapter eight unless you understand seven. And I know that the reality of uh, life and the fact that half of you are either sick, in bed, sipping coffee, or somewhere between the equator and the Flinders Ranges last week, you probably missed seven. Uh, so go back and watch that. But I just want to really quickly catch us up because when we come to Joshua 7 and 8, they're actually two sides of the same coin, right? It's, it's, the one, it's one story. Uh, as they've put the canon of Scripture together, they've put a chapter divider in there. But they're the one and the same story. And it's really important that we grasp that because it's a, it's a beautiful picture that goes hand in hand. It's, it's one side of a coin, then you flip the side of the coin. It's like, this is what happens when you do a particular thing and then you flip the coin and this is what happens when you do a different thing. And so we're at the city of Ai and Ai means a pile of ruins. You remember from last week, Israel have just walked in, around and through Jericho, which means city on the moon, so an impenetrable fortress. And then they've turned their attention to I, and they went to I without seeking God and they suffered a significant loss. And we talked about the fact that there are lessons in the loss, that school was in session for the children of Israel. And you know, the interesting thing about the children of Israel, it's a term used all through the Old Testament. Sometimes it's translated people of Israel, depending what translation you have, but it's the one word, it's the Hebrew word bane. Everyone say bane. It's spelt Ben with a little thing over the top of the E when they translate it from Hebrew to English. And it means Bane, which is interesting, the Bane of Israel. Uh, people, anyway. I thought that was funny as well, thank you. <laughs> so we see the children of Israel are going to school to learn a lesson from God. And throughout chapter seven, there's this revelation, first and foremost, that there's sin in the camp. Why did they suffer loss? Because there's sin in the camp. And that sin was the, the sin of materialism, consumerism, and narcissism at the hands of Achan. And it was one person, but the sin of one person infiltrates the sin of a nation. And we can never say that sin is an isolated thing. Sin always affects others. And so not only does God reveal that there's sin in the camp, He then actually exposes Achan. He exposes that sin, and then He deals with that sin. And so you get to the end of chapter seven, you think this is pretty heavy, this is pretty full on. Israel, yeah, they've gone through some stuff, they've done some dumb stuff, they've made some mistakes and they've copped the, the consequences of those mistakes. But then you turn the page to eight and you see the opposite side of the same coin. And this is how it begins, chapter eight. It says, then the Lord. Everyone say then. Then the Lord. So as you come to chapter eight, the first thing you have to realise is it begins with a then, which means on the other side of judgment is mercy, which means on the other side of repentance is restoration. Then the Lord, then the Lord. You've gone through some stuff, you made some mistakes, you learned some lessons, then the Lord. Then the Lord, on the other side of judgment is, is mercy and the mercy of God. And we're gonna see how Israel have, have grown. We're gonna see what lessons Israel have learned from seven as they step into eight. And we get a picture that all of seven and eight is about one particular theme. When you read them in context together, even chapter six actually, when you read it in context together, all of it, is actually about a lesson in freedom, in biblical freedom, in what it means to truly be free. How do we, as the people of God, the bane of God, the children of God, how do we walk in freedom? How do we know freedom? That's what this is all about. Seven, they do it their way. They think we're free. We're free, we're across, the, we're across the Jordan, we're in the promised land. We can do whatever we wanna do, we're gonna do it our way. And instead of walking in freedom, what happens to them? They suffer a loss to I, a pile of ruins. They become subject to their own sin. And yet in eight, something shifts and they do something different and they encounter this beautiful move of God and they begin to walk in freedom. So we're gonna, 
we're gonna read this. We'll, we'll work our, I'm not gonna read the whole chapter straight away, but we'll work our way through it. We'll read verses one through eight, then we'll jump ahead to 21 and 22 for context. And then let's see it. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack I, for I have delivered into your hands the king of I, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do to I and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Remember in, in seven, he said, I'm gonna keep the, the, the plunder of Jericho because we bring the first fruits to God because we understand that God's the one who gave us everything that we have. And so he says, give me the first fruit. And Achan couldn't. Achan was drawn. He's like, no, I'm keeping that. And if only he'd waited. Because when you get to eight, God says, all right, you gave me the first fruit. Now the plunder's yours. Set an ambush behind the city. So Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai. He chose 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them out at night. Remember in seven, how many did they say? Two or 3,000. You don't need many, just do it our way. Just two or 3,000 will be enough. When God said, no, 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 the whole army goes. And Joshua says, now after the lesson from I has sunk in, he chooses 30,000 of his best fighting men and sent them at night with these orders. Listen carefully. You are to set an ambush behind the city. Do not go very far from it. All of you be on the alert. And I, I and all those with me will advance on the city. And when the men come out against us, as they did before, we'll flee from them. They'll pursue us until we have lured them away from the city for they will say they are running away from us as they did before. So when we flee from them, you are to rise up from ambush and take the city. The Lord your God will give it into your hand. And when you have taken the city, set it on fire. Do what the Lord has commanded. Do what the Lord has commanded. Seven, they did it their way. Eight, do what the Lord has commanded. The Lord laid out this plan. See to it, you have my orders. Jump ahead, verse 21. For when Joshua and all the Israelites saw that the ambush had taken the city, so they do it. They do it. They do what God says and it all works. They pretend to be fleeing. The people of Ai all run out, says the entire fighting army came out to track them down and then they come in. And when Joshua and Israel saw the ambush had taken the city and that smoke was going up from it, they turned around and attacked the men of Ai. Those in the ambush also came out of the city against them so that they were caught in the middle. The Israelites on both sides, Israel cut them down, leaving them neither survivors nor fugitives, but they took the king of Ai and brought him to Joshua. Lord, bless your word. Thank you for your word. Your word is good. Your word is true. Father, I pray that you would minister to our souls today. God, what we don't need is just another preach. What we don't need are more words. What we need is a demonstration of your Holy Spirit and of power. So do that, Lord. Take these words and minister to our souls. Transform our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. So as we read seven and eight, and we get this picture of God teaching the children of Israel, I think there's a reason why the Bible constantly refers to the people of Israel, the children of Israel. Because there is something with, and same with us, yeah? Like we're for, as God's children. And that's a beautiful thing, but it's also a complicated thing. You with me? Because what do we know about children? And children has nothing to do with age. Children has everything to do with identity when it comes to God. We are His children. And though we get older, we are always still children, which means we're always still learning. And what we know about children is that sometimes we get things really right and sometimes we get things really wrong. Amen, anybody? Like, the other day, I was catching up with some friends and we were talking about like our first God encounter, when God really moved on our lives, when, when things were going good. And I, I shared this story, which I've shared with some of you before, when I was a super young man and we had, when I say young man, I mean a little boy. And 
we had a sleepover at mum and dad's friend's house. They were called the Burt's. And mum and dad obviously decided to go and have a cheeky weekend. And that's great. You've got to do that every now and then as a married couple. And we, there's five of us, and we went to the Burt's house. So we, we spent Saturday with the Burt's, Saturday night with the Burt's, Sunday morning we went to church. And at church, I was Westbourne Park uniting with wooden pews and uh, old school, not a single person in that church would ever have thought of raising their hands. It was very much just prim, prom and proper. And we're sitting there and the service happened and the last song came on, which is the benediction. And we used to sing uh, the, the beautiful benediction from Jude, now unto him, anybody? Now unto him who is able to keep. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. So that's what we sung at the end of every service. Now, I'm, I'm a kid, right? And so at the end of this service with the Burt's, for some reason, we start singing that song and I, as my child self, decided it was appropriate to stand on the pew, lift both of my hands to the Lord, and go, now unto him who is able to keep. Because you have to sing it that way, right? <laughs> and there I was just belting it out with my hands up, completely oblivious to the fact that there was a whole lot of people looking at me like, what the heck is going on with Dave? And I'll never forget when church finished, mum, obviously the birds took us back to mum and dad's house and mum and dad said, oh, how was how was church? And I'll never forget, Sue said, she goes, well, Dave enjoyed himself. <laughs> Just this, one of those childlike faith moments, yeah? Childlike faith. The funny thing is, is probably the very next Sunday, I would have been in the same church with a sharpened pencil, so it was really hard, probably carving my name into the pew, behaving poorly, yes? And this is the thing about children. We have moments of childlike obedience, childlike faith, childlike leaning into God, leaning into the Father, relying on the Father, showing beautiful trust. But we also have many moments of childish faith and childish behaviour where we actually reject the Father's authority, where we reject the parent authority and we wanna do things our way. And we see this constant tension at play with children where there's the childlike obedience, the beautiful leaning in that Jesus talks about, where Jesus says, unless you come to me as a child, you'll never inherit the kingdom. Where Jesus wants us to be childlike in our reliance upon Him and our trust in Him and our believing in Him. But then Paul says, when I became a man, I gave childish ways away. I got rid of childish ways so there's like this encouragement to be childlike, but a rebuke when we're childish. Are you with me? And this is what we see with Israel. This is what we see in our own lives all of the time. It doesn't matter if you're three, four or 94. All of us have this tension at play within us where God is calling us to a childlike faith, a childlike obedience. And when we, when we, Get it right, it's beautiful, it's this maturity. We don't often link childlike and maturity together, but it is, it's a mature faith that leans into God and, and trusts God and holds on to God. But we're also wrestling with the childish faith where it's all about me and chasing after what I want. This is seven and eight. Seven, childish, eight, childlike. Seven, childish, eight, childlike and you see the lesson school is in session God is saying how do you walk in true freedom well you become childlike you are you become like someone who totally trusts and relies on me and then as you submit to my authority as you submit to my ways then you will know what it means to walk in the freedom of the promise of God if you do it your way, if you submit to your own childish desires, you will never walk in the fullness of the freedom that God has bought for you. Seven is childish, eight is childlike, and here's what we learn. Are you ready? Here's what we learn as we bring the lesson out. This is what God is teaching. First and foremost, we need to be a people. When we are childlike, when we are submitted to the Father, 
we will be a people who learn to embrace rebuke. We will be a people who learn to embrace rebuke. At the end of chapter seven, God scolds Joshua. Joshua, after ignoring God and doing it his way, comes to God in prayer and he says, why is this happening? And God says to him, get up. He doesn't say, oh, poor Joshua. I'm so sorry you feel that way. Would you like to come and sit down and have a hot chockey and a conversation? You want some marshmallows with that? He doesn't soften. He just goes, get up. You didn't do it the right way. And because you didn't do it the right way, this curse is now resting upon this nation. If you did it the right way, it wouldn't have happened this way. And he just gives him a rebuke. And the beauty of Joshua is he responds immediately. He doesn't tantrum. He doesn't go off in a huff and say, well, that's not fair. He just responds with childlike obedience. Here's my question to us. How do we go with rebuke? How do we go when we get a rebuke from the Lord? Because you know you're growing in maturity when you can hear a rebuke and instead of just rejecting it and getting, you know, the, our guard, I mean, like, no, I'm not gonna listen to that. No, we might react initially like, oh, that was harsh, but then we take it on and we go, okay, God, what are you teaching me? Can we receive rebuke? Not just receive, can we embrace it? You see, humility, which is a part of childlike obedience, embraces a, a loving, truthful word spoken because we understand it comes from love. We understand the character of God, that it comes from love and therefore we will embrace it and we'll move forward in it. Childish behaviour will not receive it. He says, I want you to be a people who embrace rebuke. I talk to my kids about this all the time because when you coach them in sport, it's a different dynamic. And one of the funny things is that when you're coaching a child in sport, especially when they're your child, they don't like to be rebuked. And it's not even that harsh. It's just a gentle thing like go left instead of going right all the time. I don't wanna hear that. I remember I sat him down. I said, guys, when I was a kid, I had a coach, I would sit on a chair and he would be in the change room swearing at us, throwing a basketball against the wall this far above our head to try and get us to focus. Nowadays, that's probably not okay. <laughs> Don't do that. But I'll never forget one day, there was this one kid who just would not receive any sort of constructive feedback from this coach. And he sat him down in front of all of us and he said, the only reason I give feedback is because I care because I actually think much of you. I think you could be something. I think you could, you could grow, you could become something special. If I didn't care, if I didn't believe in you, if I didn't think you had what it took, I wouldn't bother. There would be no rebuke because what's the point? The reason God rebukes His children is because He believes that we can be what He's calling us to be. He believes that He's rising up an army that we would go out and we would be His hands and feet on the earth. So He says, hey, what you're doing is not good. Change, receive the rebuke and begin to walk in what He's calling us to because He actually cares. That's why the Word corrects us, yes? Number two, number two, receive renewal. Then the Lord said to Joshua, after all that just happened, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you. Go up and attack I, for I have delivered into your hands the king of I. Here's the other problem with a childish faith is a childish faith sits in guilt and shame and can never walk forward in renewal. It just got awfully quiet in here. Because we love to sit in our guilt and shame instead of coming to Christ, hearing the rebuke, but then hearing the word of renewal, hearing the fact that in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. You have been set free. The truth sets you free. So don't sit under it. Don't put the guilt and shame on the shoulder. Don't sit there and go, I made a mistake. How can God ever use me? Why would He ever use me? I'm better off just sitting back here. We'll never take eye. It's never possible. No, he says, get up and get back on with it. That beautiful saying that when you stumble, stumble in his direction and when you fall, fall on your knees. 
Know that we have a God. Yes, He is a consuming fire. Yes, He is holy. Yes, He is glorious and splendorous. And we, like the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but He is also love. He is merciful. On the other side of judgment is mercy. On the other side of repentance is restoration. So know who you are and walk in that freedom. Receive renewal. Let it wash over you. Run with it. You know, Joe and I, when we were at Bible college, there's this, this lady used to come in and she would, have, she would be in a walker and she had an assistant and she was very frail. Hair was like matted, oily, not healthy at all. She just looked very, very, very unwell. And we used to think, I wonder what's going on with that lady. And one day in a lecture, she, asked, she put her hand up and asked this question of the lecturer because we were talking, I think we were talking heaven and hell. And she said to the lecturer, she goes, is my child in hell or in heaven? And the lecturer said, you're gonna have to, like, I don't quite understand the question. Can you? And he did this in front of everyone. It was a, it was a holy moment. And she made the comment, she said, I had a child out of wedlock and it died. And a pastor came and said to me, listen to this, he said, because you gave birth in sin, your child is in hell. We watched as this lecturer explained the gospel, spoke the love of God over her, spoke forgiveness over her and just released something over her life. I kid you not, no word of a lie. Two weeks later, we didn't see her for a couple of weeks. Two weeks later, she came in, no walker, no helper, her hair looked healthy, her face had changed, honestly, everything had changed. She walked in feeling healed, whole and delivered because she had sat under condemnation for I don't know how many years and that condemnation was literally killing her and the moment she received renewal in her spirit, she was set free and began to walk in what God had for her. We have to be a people who receive that renewal. There's gotta be repentance. There's gotta be that receiving the rebuke, but then walk in who you are in Christ. Amen? Amen. Number three, walk in reverence. As you read chapter eight, verse three, all the way through to 29, it's the picture of the battle. And as you read the picture of the battle against I, Israel do literally everything God says, word for word. At not one moment do they go off and do their own thing. The question I find myself asking as I examine that is why? Is it because they were told to do it? And for me, I say, well, I'm not sure that it is because they were also told to do it in chapter seven and they didn't. So why now? And here's the thing, something within them, something that happened in seven has caused them to behave differently before a holy God. They have encountered His holiness. They have encountered His splendour And they have now in them what the Bible in Proverbs would call the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord has brought wisdom. And wisdom will cause a heart and a lifestyle of obedience. This is the difference between religion and relationship, friends. If it's just religion saying you must tick this box, this box, this box and this box in order to please God, you've got it wrong and you'll never walk in freedom. But when you have a fear of God, a healthy, a reverence for God, when you understand who He is in all His glory, when we read the names of Christ, when we understand He is the one who made everything, He is the one who upholds everything. He is the first and the last. He is the soon coming King. He is the one who will roll up the universe like a scroll. He is the one before whom every single knee will bow. He is the one who stomped on the devil's head. Yes, his heel was struck, but he crushed the devil on the cross of Calvary. And then he crushed death when he rose back up victoriously and ascended to the right hand of the Father and gave his spirit to establish his church. When we catch a picture of that, 
Life is different. And what I've realised in the last couple of years is there's nothing that I can say to bring that revelation into your heart. It is only the Holy Spirit who can do it. Faith comes by hearing, yes, and hearing the Word of God, but is the, the faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And my prayer for us this morning is that the Holy Spirit would take that picture, He would take something of who He is and that right now He would pierce your hearts with a fresh revelation of who Christ is and honestly just leave us falling face down in the presence of His glory. Because that's what that picture will do for us. When we know who He is, it puts a reverence in our hearts and obedience is the overflow of reverence. Obedience is the overflow of reverence. And then I wanna show you something else because when we begin to walk in reverence, when we understand what Christ has done for us, there is still a part we have to play and this is this, we need to take responsibility. Take responsibility. Back to the Word. Verse three, so Joshua and the whole army moved out to attack Ai and he chose 30,000. Everyone say 30,000. 30,000 of his fighting men to go. Verse 11, then the entire force that was with him marched up and approached the city and arrived in front of it. All through this chapter, everybody takes responsibility. God has given a promise. I'm gonna give you I, but all of you have to go. The mistake that happened last time was they said, well, God's done it. He just overthrew Jericho. He just parted the waters of the Jordan. We don't have to do anything. Just send a few folk to go and get them. And it all came crumbling down. And God says, no, 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 no. I've taken responsibility for salvation. You now work out that salvation with fear and trembling. Oh, come on, somebody. No one wants to say amen to that, so I'm gonna say amen to myself. (laughs) I've taken responsibility for salvation. You work out that salvation with fear and trembling. You take responsibility for your walk of faith. You take responsibility for your walk of faith. God has done everything. He has taken responsibility for the whole death issue and, the, and he's like taken responsibility for the whole curse of sin and death and given us life. It's a pretty big deal. And then he's like, now you come follow me. And there are people all through the scriptures who will come to Christ and his answer every time is you come follow me. And he says, you got a choice. Choose this day. This is Joshua. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day. You come follow me. You're gonna follow me? I'm not chasing you now. I've already pursued you to the ends of the earth. I have pursued you to a cross. I have done everything. I've sent my spirit to draw you unto myself. I have done everything there is to do. Now you choose who you will follow. When we first came to not this, well, it is this church, but over at Allgate, when we first came and we had just one child, little Bailey, we went into a small group with Craig and Kathy Schultz. Some of you know Craig and Kathy. He was our Allgate campus pastor for a while. I remember Joe and I in this moment with a one-year-old. And we looked at Craig and Kathy and they had, I always say I think they've got three, but I think they have four children. Someone, yes, thank you. Love you, Craig. We laugh about this all the time. All four of them walking with the Lord. All four of them chasing after the things of God. All four of them, different journey, ups, downs, Lots of difficulty, but all of those children walking with the Lord. I remember we said to them, what have you done? Young people in the room, look at me right now, young people, whether you're married, not married, whether you're starting a family or dreaming of a family one day, find someone who's been there and done that and ask them that question, what have you done? Find someone who can speak into your life. Find someone older than you, wiser than you and look to them. Do not just assume because someone's got grey hair or turning grey hair that they have no wisdom to offer you. They do. That's why we believe in an intergenerational church because in the body of believers, there should be all ages and all pictures of wisdom because that's how we learn from one another and grow. That's a complete tangent, but I felt God say it. We said to Craig and Kathy, what have you done? 
You know what Craig said to us? He said, we did a whole lot of things wrong, Dave. And there's a whole lot of things we can't control. They have to make some decisions for themselves. But a couple of things we did do, we went to church. And it was hard sometimes. And we got nothing out of it sometimes because it was loud and the children were running around and playing with toys in the corner. It was difficult. But we prioritise being with the people of God because that's God's way. And it was hard and difficult, but we were there. We prayed with them. And sometimes I just wanted to boot them and kick them into bed and be like, I'm done with you for the day. But we chose to pray. We read the Word with them. And sometimes I didn't want to read the Word with them. Sometimes we fought about it because they wanted to read Star Wars or whatever they wanted to read. Not saying that's not good, read Star Wars. It's all good stuff. But read the Word because the Word is life. Like make some key decisions to take responsibility. Take responsibility. Press in and pray and hold fast to God and let God do what He wants to do, knowing that your children, when they grow up, they have to take responsibility too. But you do everything you can while you can for the glory of God. Can I get an amen, someone? Take responsibility. And lastly, jump ahead. Let's go to verse 30 to 35. Sheree, you can come up and we'll close in a second. This morning when I woke up, um, I felt the Lord just say, the church doesn't need more instruction. The church doesn't need to be entertained and it doesn't need to do its duty. What it needs this morning is ministry of my spirit. So in a minute, I'm gonna invite people to respond and we're gonna clear some chairs out and we're gonna create space and we'll just let God do what he wants to do. That's me being obedient, trying to be childlike, not childish. So know that that's coming, okay? Verse 30 to 35, watch this. Then Joshua built on Mount Abal an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the Israelites, he built it according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses. He's talking about Deuteronomy 11, of uncut stones on which no iron tool had been used. On it they offered to the Lord burnt offerings and sacrificed fellowship offerings. There in the presence of the Israelites, Joshua wrote on stones a copy of the law of Moses. All the Israelites with their elders, officials and judges were standing on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord facing the Levitical priests who carried it. Both the foreigners living among them and the native born were there. Half of the people stood in front on Mount Gerizim. Everyone say Gerizim. And half of them in front on Mount Abal. Everyone say Abal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had formally commanded when he gave instructions to bless the people of Israel. Deuteronomy 11. Afterward, Joshua read all the words of the law, the blessings and curses, Deuteronomy 28, just as written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded that Joshua did not read to the whole assembly of Israel, including the women and children and the foreigners who lived among them. Okay, what the heck is this all about? Here's what you gotta understand. In Deuteronomy 11, Moses said, when you cross over into the promised land, you gotta go to two mountains. Two mountains that stand side by side. One is Gerizim and one is Abal, and in the middle is a town called Shechem. And what you gotta do is you gotta stand on Gerizim and Abal, and you've gotta proclaim the law of God. Now let's get, oh, it's already up there, how good. Now Gerizim means blessing, and a Baal means curse. Here's a crazy truth. When you go here, even today, and you go in the springtime, where there's been all sorts of rain, what you will see is that Gerizim, physically, is beautiful, luscious, and green. What you will see is that literally right next door, a Baal is barren and dry all year round. Now, if you go in the summer, they're both dry. 
because it's Israel. But in the spring, when the rains have come, Gerizim is green and Abal is still barren. And it's a physical picture of the spiritual reality of what's going on here. Because Israel stood before these mountains and on the, the Mount of Gerizim, they declared the blessings of God. They spoke from Deuteronomy 28, the blessing of God. If you have a childlike faith, if you obey, if you submit to Him, you will walk in freedom. Blessing of God. If you reject the law, if you behave childishly and choose to go your own way, you will forsake the blessing of God and with it is actually a curse. And so every year, for over 3,000 years, 4,000 years, there's been a physical reminder of a spiritual truth. You cannot go to Shechem and not see in the springtime and not catch a revelation of the power of God when we follow Him to walk in His earthly blessing and when we abandon Him to walk in the curse. Now we need to catch something really quickly. Sometimes God's blessing we think is a curse. Sometimes like God's blessing is for His glory and our good. And so while we think it's hard and we're like, I don't like this, I must be under God's curse. Sometimes it's actually His blessing because He's drawing you to Himself. Preach it, pastor. And sometimes what we think is a is a blessing is actually a curse. Because we've done it ourselves and we've heaped up wealth. Read the book of Proverbs, but actually it's ultimately gonna lead to our destruction. So the key is not whether there's, there is physical manifestations, the key is obedience. And you know that when you're in obedience, when you're standing on Gerizim, you can claim the promise of God, you can claim the blessing of God. But here's the thing, the children of Israel spoke it out. They spoke it out, they declared it. And as you keep reading, you'll see that all the nations, the kings heard of this and then they rallied and they got ready for war because something that was spoken triggered something in them. Here's what I want you to grab, church. Here's what the Lord's put on my heart. Listen up, two more minutes. Here's what I want you to grasp. Word is seed. Word is seed. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. What we speak is important. Word is seed. Now there's, Jesus talks about the, the sower. We sow the Word of God and it can land on different types of soil, but Word is seed. So when we speak the promise of God, when we speak the reality of God, when we speak the blessing of God, when we speak the power of God, the truth of God, as we declare truth, we are sowing seed and seed will take root. And this is part of that responsibility. So if you tend the soil, what is spoken, that seed will take root and it will bring about a harvest. Now here's the reverse. Here's what happens. Too often we speak the opposite. Too often the words we use are not truth, but they are lie. And so we are sowing a seed that is a lie. And it's the same principle. If we sow lies, it will reap a harvest of negativity. It will reap a harvest in accordance with the lie that has been sown. And we see this on people, I know, I know the kids around, concentrate, this is important. If we sow the right thing, if we sow truth, it will bring about a childlike faith in our hearts, a childlike obedience, a trust and reliance on God. If we sow in lies, it will bring about something contrary to the will of God on your life. What is the enemy? What does the devil do? Who is he? He's the father of lies. He's the accuser of the brethren. Satan knows this better than the church. And so he will, his weapon is a word. His weapon is lies. He's painted himself out to be in the West, either nothing, he doesn't exist, or we get this picture of there he is with his red horns and the master of hell. No, no, he's the father of lies. And He wants to sow lies. He wants to speak lies. He wants us to believe something, one about ourselves, two about God, two about our, three about our circumstance. He's sowing lies over the people of God, the accuser of the brethren, over and over and over again. We need to know that we have a weapon against our adversary. We don't need to attribute more power to Him and His servants than He is worth. He is a defeated foe. He's been crushed under the heel of Christ. 
Jesus has all authority. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Church, you've got to catch this. All authority. So we need to take up that authority. We need to proclaim truth. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Helmet of salvation. That's guarding our thoughts. Belt of truth. Proclaim truth. Sandals of peace. Peace is shalom. It's the gospel. We proclaim where we go. Truth, truth, truth is everything. And when we speak truth, when we declare truth, when we walk in truth, when we proclaim truth, sowing the seed of truth, the enemy's lies will break over our lives. And we'll begin to walk in freedom. Why do they declare it on Gerizim and Abal? Because they're, sp- they're sowing seed. This is the monument. This is the moment that they must remember no matter what's going on in your life, whether it looks barren or it looks good. Proclaim truth. Hold fast to truth. Run in truth. Walk in truth. And the enemy will not get a foothold. And there's too many people who have believed too many lies. it's time for that to change. Enough is enough. So for the next couple of minutes, I know it's late, but the next couple of minutes, we're gonna devote a little bit of time just to breaking some lies and speaking some truth. To declaring from Gerizim and Abal the truth of God over the people of God. And so if you need a promise, if you need a promise today, if you need to be reminded of the truth of God, I want you to, I want you to come forward as we sing this last song. And we're gonna have, can we have the prayer team come forward, the elders come forward, and we're gonna pray and declare truth. But here's the thing that's been on my heart. There's many people here who have believed lies about themselves. Someone at some point in your life has spoken something over you and you cannot get free. Today it goes. Today it breaks through the proclamation of truth. And we want you to come forward. We want to pray with you. We want to speak truth over you. We want to break the lies of the enemy and declare truth over your life that the enemy's lies would no longer have a stronghold, that the enemy's lies would no longer have mastery, but that you would walk under the Lordship and the truth of Jesus and walk in true Christian freedom as you submit yourselves to Him. Is that good?